One thing that I was relieved to see was that that dampening of carbohydrate metabolism wasn't at all detrimental to performance in the more higher intensities. You know, we haven't we haven't seen that consistently just yet because otherwise, as an athlete, I'd feel kind of bad about suggesting, oh, take this, there's a risk that it actually might take that top end off you. You know, we haven't seen that yet. So, you know, I think we need to watch and do more research because there may be some conditions where it doesn't work as well. But broadly speaking now, it's like, yeah, this, this switch from carb metabolism more towards ketone and fat metabolism is actually beneficial rather than detrimental. Thanks for joining us. It's a great time. Come next year for the party in Santa Barbara. Hey friends, welcome back to another live session. It's Mike here. We're at MHS. D Dr. Brianna Stubbs gave an amazing presentation this morning. and we one of Dr. Brendan Egan. That was amazing. Uh, that was great. It was like re a lot of back and forth, which was awesome. Uh, so I have a few mental notes from your talk. One of the things you said is we're kind of rewriting the textbooks when it comes to substrate oxidation during exercise. Can you kind of expand upon what that means? Sure. So, I mean, actually, it's some of the work we're doing with exogenous ketones and some of the work that Dr. Volek is doing with uh, keto-adapted athletes are really like challenging what people think think about, oh, this is how much carbs we can burn during exercise, this is how much fat we can burn. And, you know, they've kind of been somewhat static values in the textbooks. And textbooks are really, really, really static and, you know, don't get revised very often. And now all of this research is being like, oh, actually, we can burn ketones at the same time as we have carbs and fat present. And, you know, so it's really defining this novel metabolic state of exogenous ketosis. And then on the flip side, Dr. Volek's showing that fat adaptation is a much more profound process than we'd ever really thought before. So, you know, maybe in the future, we'll have sections of the textbook not just being like, this is typical, like, uh, carbohydrate metabolism during exercise. It'll be like, this is under specific conditions of exogenous ketosis or keto adaptation as well. It's so fascinating. There's so many things coming to mind, but I think it's confusing for the people in the public because they see a study coming out, maybe from Australia, and it will say, see, the ketogenic diet, it doesn't enhance performance, right? So people are like, then therefore I should not, you know, there's no added value for me being in ketosis. What would you say to that? Well, I mean, it depends on what your goal is long term. I mean, first thing, actually, maybe even to note before that is there's a lot of individual variability that just looking at the mean of these data doesn't really tell you. So you might have some people who respond really well and actually perform way better and feel way better and their body composition is optimized. And, you know, actually a really interesting series of studies by Karin Zinn out over in New Zealand. And she looked at athletes' well-being as well and actually quantified the asking them questions. And interestingly, these were not elite athletes. They were more like recreational athletes and a number of them said that they would stay on the ketogenic diet um, after being on in the study so I think it depends a little bit on the type of athlete and, and their goals um, gosh where are we going to go next so then I think you know the important thing to emphasize is that there's no, in the, even in the mean data, no clear benefit to the ketogenic diet in some of these elite athlete studies, but also no detrimental effect either. So if this is the lifestyle that works for you and it, and it suits you and you feel better on it, then by all means, go ahead and do it. But, you know, it maybe wouldn't necessarily be the deciding factor to convert someone who's not on keto to go on to keto. Like if you feel good on a regular diet and you perform well on a regular diet and you're not overweight and you don't have any metabolic concerns, then, you know, no reason to change at this point. But but, you know, if you're looking at uh, long t longevity, maybe, or you're trying to treat some kind of metabolic syndrome, or maybe as well, if you're an ultra endurance athlete, where being really, really well primed to burn fat is really helpful, like uh, Zach Bitter, who's been speaking here, then maybe this kind of thing is, is helpful. Right. Just make it fit your lifestyle. And one thing that I just want to underscore that you mentioned right there is the customization of this. And so, you know, there's outliers in these studies, but we don't really, in studies, we're trying to figure out what is the differences between these groups, right? And so these outliers, some benefit, some don't. And so this is where, like we were talking about last night, the coach comes in and can customize this based upon what's going to work for that individual, which I think is really creative and something sometimes that doesn't get conveyed. People want you're either high carb or you're high fat, right? Or, or in between. And so I think it's really interesting, you know, that, that we can, people have the, the wherewithal and the ability and the, the, it's okay to customize this based upon what your goals are. I mean, to me, it's kind of ridiculous that we would have one set of guidelines for all athletes or even for athletes that do even if we were more nuanced and be like, this is a guideline for endurance athletes. This is the guidelines for strength athletes, for example. You know, 
you and I have different fashion tastes, you're a different size to me. When we go into a clothes store, we buy different clothes. But also, my fashion sense has changed since I was younger and I'll probably be, I'll dress a bit differently when I'm a six-year-old lady versus now. So our metabolic needs and the choices that we need to make vary from person to person, but also within your lifetime and depending on what you're trying to prioritize. So, I mean, I think it's it's natural, therefore, to, to believe that, you know, there's not one size fits all here uh, and that we should actually exploit that and that as an athlete and a practi uh, practitioners working with athletes, should be looking at what works for their individual athlete. You know, there's the gen genetics, there's preferences, there's gut microbiome. There's so many different factors that affect how these things work for us. So it's very much more complicated than just looking at the mean. Yeah. Very, very fascinating. So kind of final question here. Were you surprised to learn that when exogenous ketones are administered pre-exercise that it changes carbohydrate oxidation and glycogen metabolism? No, actually, yeah, that was like something that I always thought would happen. If you look back at all of the old uh, classic studies that used heart, rat heart models and looked at isolated muscle metabolism, one thing that was really consistently seen is this uh, decrease in carbohydrate metabolism. Um, it was neat to see it in the whole bodies of athletes because it's actually like m could mean quite a lot in terms of uh, endurance and performance. Um, one thing that I was relieved to see was that that dampening of carbohydrate metabolism wasn't at all detrimental to performance in the more higher intensity. You know, we haven't we haven't seen that consistently just yet, because otherwise, as an athlete, I'd feel kind of bad about suggesting, oh, take this. There's a risk that it actually might take that top end off you. You know, we haven't seen that yet. So, you know, I think we need to watch and do more research because there may be some conditions where it doesn't work as well. But broadly speaking now, it's like, yeah, this this switch from carb metabolism more towards ketone and fat metabolism is actually beneficial rather than detrimental. Sure. And a lot of athletes are using this for recovery, too, maybe doing their sport, you know, in a high carb state, but then getting into ketosis to enhance recovery. So anyway, there's a lot of nuances here. And I think it's confusing for people because it's not as clear cut as here's your body weight, here's how many carbs you should have and so forth. So I think it, it creates some confusion because there's not maybe a protocol yet. No, but one of the great things about people in this community is everyone's self-experimenters and everyone's at the forefront of tracking, um, you know, all different kind of biomarker outputs and performance outputs as well. So hopefully with this kind of people working all together, we'll actually get to the solutions quicker than we might do otherwise. But it's going to take a lot of coordinated work. And, you know, I'm certainly not um, shying away from the, you know, realization that we need to do these science studies and and you know, give value to the fact of what the mean data shows. We can't just focus on the outliers all of the time to form our recommendations. So it is, is important to not forget that as well. Absolutely. Amazing insights. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, what I will do is put a link to your recent review article with John Newman, all about how ketones affect the immune cell population and fat cells, which for some of you, I think is pretty exciting. I know when I saw that article, I was really excited to hear more about that. So maybe we'll do another video, you yeah. know, down the road. I'm sure we've got a lot more to talk about. So we'll do that another time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming on and thanks for tuning in, friends.